back in Valinor, the new High King was Feanor, eldest son of Finwë and creator of the Silmarils, said to be the most gifted elf to ever live. With a spirit so powerful, it drained his mother's life force to the point where she lost all joy and voluntarily ended her physical existence in order to live as a spirit in the halls of Mandos, a place where all spirits went to rest and be judged after the deaths of their mortal bodies. Outraged by the crimes against his family, the new High King Feanor gave a rousing speech and swore a powerful oath along with his seven sons, vowing to recover the Silmarils by any means and at any cost. This meant sailing east to fight the War of Great Jewels against Melkor, renamed Morgoth meaning Black Enemy. Superseding the history of hostility between the sons of Finwë, the younger brothers Fingolfin and Finarfin temporarily unified under the new High King, but soon enough fractured once more when Feanor and his most loyal followers committed the first kin slaying, slaughtering the Teledi Elves of the coast when they refused to allow the use of their ships for the voyage east across the sea. This divide between the High King's most dedicated followers and those of his brothers would, for a time, improve, but never fully mend as the Feanor faction's unending pursuit of the Silmarils eventually led them to commit two more kinslayings. In response to their departure and the first kinslaying, the great Vala Mandos the Doomsman, who ruled over the spirits of the dead in the halls of Mandos, foresaw tragedy and devastation for all Noldor that left the Undying Lands. Upon hearing the doom of Mandos, Feanor's youngest brother Finarfin led roughly a tenth of their people back to Valinor, while the High King departed with his supporters across the sea, abandoning Fingolfin's faction, as he was angered by their criticisms of the kinslaying and felt they could not be sufficiently relied upon in the coming war. Yet the remaining Noldor under Fingolfin were determined to reach Middle-earth, as many of them had their own reasons for leaving and held their own hatred for Morgoth, regardless of their disagreements with the High King. Therefore, Fingolfin led his people north through the dangerous icy wastes of Hilkaraxe, where many were lost in the crossing. Meanwhile, Melkor ruled from his fortress of Angban, gathering together all former servants, including his chief lieutenants, the Maiar Sauron and Gothmog, to spread corruption across the continent. In the east, the younger children of Eru started coming into the world, beginning with the seven dwarf clans waking during the years of the trees to claim the blue, misty, and red mountains. The adopted children of Eru, the dwarves had a unique origin, as they were given life not by the creator, but rather the Vala Aule, the smith, a great craftsman who, like Melkor, had a passion for creation and sought to form intelligent beings of his own design. Yet unlike Melkor, once Aule realized his dwarves would never have independent thought without the flame imperishable, he apologized to Eru, who forgave him and adopted the dwarves as his own, giving them a secret fire and placing them to sleep so they might one day awaken into the world. Though they were not given the gift of immortality, with most living two to three hundred years, they had a unique fate awaiting them after death, as their spirits would return to the service of their original creator, Aule. A short, squat, resourceful people, often distinguished by their enormous beards, dwarves had a passion for craftwork and mining, making the mountains their homes, where they largely kept to their own affairs. Though the elves and dwarves populated many lands, it would be the youngest children of Eru who spread furthest throughout Middle-earth. Waking in the lands of Hildorian, they rose with the sun and moon, created by the Valar to replace the two trees and illuminate the entire world, thereby beginning the first stage of Middle-earth. Yet as human settlements spread, they came under the influence of the Dark Lord, causing some to depart from the lands of the east, journeying west until reaching Beleriand where they were known as the Edain. Over the next five centuries, the Noldor Elves fought the War of Great Jewels alongside their allies, including the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains, Edain Humans, and some of the Sindar Elves, losing many great heroes like High King Feanor who died fighting a horde of Balrogs, and his successor Fingolfin who died in single combat with Morgoth. Yet the allies also won a number of early victories, allowing the Elves to live in relative peace for centuries. But the Dark Lord was cunning and patient, raising great armies filled not only with his Maiar servants and the lowly orcs, but also other corrupted creatures, like the trolls who were once Ents, peaceful, intelligent, tree-like beings that watched over the forests of Middle-earth. He also made dragons and other wicked creatures, allowing him to eventually conquer nearly all of Beleriand. In the end, total defeat was only avoided when the half-elven hero Earendil and his mixed-blood wife journeyed west to the Undying Lands with a Silmaril jewel stolen from the crown of Morgoth. Begging for their assistance, the Valar decided to intervene and launched the War of Wrath, a bloody, 40-year struggle in which they defeated and captured Morgoth, with his feet hewn from under him before the Valar executed his body and banished his spirit from Arda, setting guards to enforce his exile. Yet prophecy stated Morgoth would one day return and wage a final battle to end the world. The dawn of the Second Age meant the War of Great Jewels was over, with the final two Silmarils ending up in the hands of Maedros and Maglor, the last living sons of Feanor. Yet they'd done so much evil to fulfill their oath, the jewels deemed them unworthy and burned their hands. 
Unable to live with all he'd done, Maedros threw himself and his jewel into a fiery chasm, while Maglor tossed his Silmaril into the ocean, living out his days singing and wandering aimlessly throughout Middle-earth. For centuries, the Valar did their best to avoid interfering in the affairs of the East, and were once again reminded why, as their fighting caused the collapse of Beleriand into the sea. Therefore, they resolved to return home and never again interfere with the peoples of Middle-earth, issuing a pardon to the Noldor while extending an invitation to any other elves who wished to make the voyage west. Many were grateful and left for the Undying Lands, while others remained behind to found new realms in Middle-earth. Although the elves were given the option to enjoy an enchanted paradise, the other races, including the other children of Eru, were forbidden from traveling west through the ban of the Valar, as their mortal forms could not withstand the magic flowing through their lands, and it would end up shortening their lives considerably. Yet this division led to a more philosophical argument between the original children of Eru, which delved into their specific gifts, as the elves were granted immortality but were tied to the world, meaning that when this creation ended, so too would their current form of existence. Men, however, were granted the gift of mortality, meaning they were not tied to this world, and after death would go on to a second unknown destiny prepared by the Creator. For many years, these diverging fates caused no major issues between the races, but in time, some men would object, believing their gift to be a curse, envious of the immortal elves living in paradise. As for the human houses of the Edain, who fought for the Valar, they became the Dunedain, rewarded with increased wisdom, longer lifespans, enhanced abilities, and a new island home raised in the middle of the Sea of Belegair. Establishing the kingdom of Numenor, Elros, a son of Earendil, ruled as their first king, blessed with even greater abilities and longer life than his people, as he and his brother Elrond were descended from a powerful bloodline which included elven kings, chieftains of men, and even a Maya queen. The Valar, therefore, granted them the right to choose their own fate among the children of Eru, causing Elrond to take the life of an immortal elf, while Elros chose to be a man, granted the gift of mortality. Yet while Elros was destined to die, his extraordinary bloodline allowed him to live five centuries, establishing the foundations of a mighty human kingdom that rose to become the most powerful realm in the world east of Valinor. Among the many heroes descended from the lineage of Elrond and Elros were important, famous figures of history like Ar Farazon, High King Elendil, High King Isildur, Arwen the Evenstar, and the ranger Aragorn, who became High King Alessar. Back in Middle-earth, survivors recovered as best they could, with the dwarves of the Blue Mountains joining Durin's folk in khazad Dun, while the non-Edain humans of the West, known as Middlemen, for the most part retained good relations with their neighbors, though some spoke a different language than the rest, and over time were no longer considered kin, becoming known as Dunlindings. As for the Elves, they largely abandoned their old divisions and lived together in the newly formed Kingdom of Lindon, under High King Gilgalad, one of the last surviving descendants of High King Finwë. Among those in Lindon was Lord Círdan, who ruled over the port city of the Greyhaven, still on his mission to make ships for his people. Then there were those elves with more adventurous spirits, who journeyed into the lands of the east, coming into contact with their ancient kinsmen, descended from those Teleri who abandoned the great journey to Valinor early on, and now populated the forests east of the Misty Mountains. These Teleri, now called Silvan, welcomed the more advanced western elves with open arms, even accepting the Sindar noble Amdir as king of Lothlorien, and the former lord of Doriath Orifer as king of the Woodland Realm. Around 750 SA, Celebrimbor, the grandson of Feanor, founded the realm of Eregion near the Misty Mountains where they specialized in smithwork. Though Morgoth was defeated and could no longer directly influence the world, some of his orcs, trolls, dragons, balrogs, and other servants fled east, as did his lieutenant Sauron, who became the new Dark Lord of Middle-earth. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Sir Gil of Tarth, James the Cheap, Tim, Kristen Greeneyes of the Company of the Cat, and John Amber of White Fork. If you'd like to help contribute to the channel, be sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.